really glad to be here with you, and uh, I really honored to can talk in uh, in this uh, prestigious institute. So, uh, talking about Cesare Lombroso does not leave us indifferent, generating al always strong and conflicting feeling. Lombroso is considered either a, a genius or a charlatan, or both. If his detractors call him the Hellenist of the Stilliard, l'alienista della Stadera, even now Lombroso is defined in many handbooks as the father of modern criminology. Acclaimed by students and followers, Lombroso is recognized to be the founder of a new science, and his books were translated in several languages, so much that to be the most widely read Italian author in the world in the late 19th century. At the same time, he was called by colleagues and adversaries. Over the, over the course of the last century, he has been accused of a number of misdeeds, it suffice to recall the judgment expressed at the end of 19, uh, 1970 by historian George Mosse, who mentioned Lombroso's born criminal theory as the inspiration behind the final solution. Despite Lombroso's Jewish heritage, a few years later, American paleontologist Stephen Jay Gould blamed Lombroso for his pseudo-scientific theories, inception of racism and biological determinism. Actually, Lombroso and his school fell into oblivion soon after his death in 1909 due to the Catholic Church. In particular, they can be accredited to Father Agostino Gemelli, who wrote the book Funeral of a Man and of a Doctrine, published with the intention of deconstructing Lombroso's work. In addition, the neo-idealist doctrine, eminently represented by Benedetto Croce and Giovanni Gentile, had probably contributed to his decline. I do not want to dwell on the reasons of the oblivion, but rather understand if his imagined his doctrine uh, through is uh, almost completely ignoring in Italy by jurists and criminology, so as to constitute a sort of damnatio memoriae on Lombroso. This is even more evident if you examine quotation in major national newspapers about Lombroso. When mentioning the famous psychiatrist from Verona or using the term Lombrosian, is often referred to the idea of identifying of a criminal from his face. The adjective itself, Lombrosian, is used as a, an, an insult or a joke. In many other cases, Lombroso is ridiculed through re regaling curious anecdotes or eccentric statements from his vast work. The question arises about the reasons from the popularity, both positive and negative, of Lombroso. Obviously, he was not and will not be in the future the only one to theorize the biological origins of crime. Especially at the time, when, as Nicole Rafter said, biological theories and criminology were virtually synonymous. However, it was definitely the most famous across the world, thanks to these theories. Consider the British prison medical officer James Bruce Thompson and John Wilson, who theorized about the biological and hereditary nature of criminality, or um, Richard for Krafabing in Germany, Rafael Salillas from Mad Madrid, well known also the little Spanish Lombroso, or in Ignacio, in Ignacio Valenti Vivo in Catalonia. Despite the intellectual climate of the time was beneficial to the development of biological theories of crime, there is nevertheless a unique feature that makes the Lombrosian research different from that of other coeval criminologists and psychiatrists. Despite the simplistic readings, Lombroso founded the theory of criminal once and for all, but corrected and revised their theories continuously throughout his, his life. It's a fact to think that his famous book, L'Homo Delinquente, was published in Italian over the space Sorry. Okay. Um, over the space of 11 years, with the first edition coming out in 
1876, and lasts about uh, 200 pages, and the fifth and the final edition published in 1897 are, are uh, three volumes and over 2,000 pages. Perhaps no one describes Lombroso's methodology better than his pupil, Enrico Ferri. I quote, Cesare Lombroso looked for the fact as the hunting dog ferociously looks at the prey. And as he found the fact, his, his brain lit up and threw out sparks of wonderful insights. And the most distant phenomena were explained by his, his thought on unexpected contact and comparison." End of quote. So rethink, rethinking the studies already conducted in the areas of craniology and phrenology, Lombroso was strongly influenced by positivism and decided to investigate the phenomenon of deviance by analyzing it through an experimental method that accepted as a scientific fact only what could be rigorously established, measured, and cataloged by scientific means. Lombroso believed in a religion of the facts, which attempted to certify scientific differences not only between criminals and so-called normal people, but also between different types of criminals. Believing that physical monstrosity also reflect a moral monstrosity, he embarked on an intensive search through the bodies and the faces of prisoners and the mentally incapacitated in order to find the stigmata of deviance, the unmistakable, irrefutable evidence that a criminal is predetermined to commit evil acts because he is biologically different from any, any other human being. The most emblematic example of this attitude is given by the Museum of Criminal Anthropology, Cesare Lombroso in Turin. Visiting the silent museum's rooms is impossible to remain insensitive. Not by chance, this museum appears to the world's top 10 of the scariest museums. It's immediately understandable that this is a, new, a unique place. It's not only an anatomical or criminological collection, but his museum, as Lombroso proudly described it. Between a cabinet of wonders and a laboratory of pathological anatomy, in this place, science and popular culture, medicine and criminology are linked. There we can see the entire iconographical apparatus of Lombrosian theories, or rather some of the heterogeneous material collected by Lombroso between 1859 until his death on 1909 from prisons, asylums, hospitals, and cemeteries in order to prove by facts is theories. As Lobroso's daughter has written, his father was a born collector, so we can find prisoners and lunatics artifacts, mug shots, and daggers in the, hidden into religion objects, but also human brains in formalin, wax masks, skulls, pieces of tattooed skin, and so on. Not only related to Italian criminals, but also to delinquents and madmen from all over the world. The museum, in its more than 150 years of history, has passed ups and down. Sorry. <laughs> Firstly, it was only a private collection of a steel line medical student and then became a true symbol of their evidence. And, uh, and Lombroso uh, transformed it in an academic institution. But after, uh, suffered a long decay during the 20th century. In this period, the museum was open and closed several times until the final renovation and reopening on November of 2009, in conjunction with the 100th anniversary of Lombroso's death. The new museum, which has received great acclaim by uh, scholars and public, being visited according to the director of the museum by over 40,000 people up to May 2011. 
However, the reopening of the museum has been strongly contested. by a minority groups of political parties as Peri Sud or, and even Lega Nord and Beppe Grillo's movement. Despite the fact that this reopening was inspired by the attempt of enlightening the scientific and historical errors of Lombroso, it was considered on the contrary as an attempt to rehabilitate Lombroso's image. Protesters argued his signs had contributed to criminalize the people from southern Italy. This protest, led by Salsaida Southern and the Neo Borbonici, the Neo Bourbons, resulted in the creation of several groups on the social network Facebook. For example, Comitato No Lombroso aimed at obtaining the immediate closure of the museum and the restitution of the skulls of southern brigands, victim of the ferocity of the Savoys, kept in the museum. This controversy was greatly blown up and politically exploded as a part of a wider dispute raised in Italy at the time of the 150th anniversary of the unification of Italy. However, it is also a sign of how the figure of Lombroso, more than a century after his death, is still viewed with strong and contra contradictory feelings, and though his legacy, at least in Italy, is a rather peculiar one. This protest culminated in a public demonstration Uh, in Turin on 8th of May 2010, when new Bourbons and new brigands with grotesque slogans like Lombroso Racist the Mazzini Terrorist or Garibaldi Motherfucker claimed the immediate closing of the museum, seen as a common grave of the southern heroes dead during the national unification process. According to the organizers of process, the museum was offensive to the people of the South for, and for human dignity in general, keeping and displaying human heads and human bones. But above all, the most contested relic is undoubtedly the skull of Giuseppe Villella. A 70-year-old brigand from Calabria under suspicion of robbery who died in prison and now object of a controversial court case. The major of Motta Santa Lucia, the small Calabrian town where Villella was born around uh, 1801, was brought in action against the University of Turin, which owns the museum, asking the return of, of this skull for decent burial. Whereas the con uh, conventional history considers the creation of the Kingdom of Italy in 1871 to have been a liberation of the South by the North, according to the New Bourbon movement, uh, it was an invasion that determined the Southern cultural identity. On the contrary, in the opinion of Silvano Montaldo, the director of the museum, this approach is the result of a distorted revisionism that ignores the real historical value of this relic. In particular, he argued that the skull is an important testimony for scientific history because these are human remains that were used to develop a scientific theory that reverberate around the world. So, Yes, there are human remains, but also they are an historical document because Lombroso left an inscription on the skull. So it has a, a double meaning. It's not just a human skull, according to Montaldo, but it's also, also a document, an important testimony to historic scientific method. This is confirmed in addition by an Italian law enforced since 2004 that extended protection of the country's rem remarkable artistic and archaeological heritage to scientific collection in public museum. But beyond the legal dispute that is still in progress, the question is who really was Villella and because his skull was so important in the construction of Lombrosian theories. The history and the identity of Villella are still covered by a mystery. 
if the opinion of neo Bourbons, Villela was one of many southern fighters against the, f the invasion of Piedmont, paying with his own life. Or on the contrary, an Italian Jack the Ripper, as it was argued by Gino Lombroso. In a recent article entitled Homes for, for Bones, published by the prestigious scientific journal Nature, Villela is even described as an Italian chief, cheese thief. Apart from the doubt if Villela was a certain hero against northern supremacy, a ferocious brigand or only a simple thief, what, what's his certain? Is the re relevance, at least symbolically, of this, this call in Lombrosian work? In 1870, during a cold gray November morning, as his daughter, Gina, told us, while he was examining the skull, Lombroso found a strange anomaly. On the occipital part, where a spine would normally be found on a human skull, there was a standard distinct depression that is called median occipital fossa. This anomaly, which Lombroso described as the birth certificate of criminal anthropology, explained the existence of, of crime through atavism from Latin atavus, or ancestor, conceding with the return to ancestral and lower stage of evolution and becoming the emblem of new legislative framework designed to frame a real science of the abnormal. After that, Lombroso theorized the inborn physical and psychological characteristics of criminals, asserting that a criminal was, since birth, I quote, a miserable variety of man, more pathological of the insane. According to Lombroso, this is the evidence that in, in criminals that are, there are frequent monstrous regression that approach man to the lowest of animals, which is the premise of this theory of the born criminal. So, it's not surprisingly that Villela's skull became, as Lombroso emphatically admit, a sort of fetish or totem of the criminal anthropology, inaugurating his frantic search for the biological origin of crime. Nearing the end of his career in 1906, Lombroso dramatically described the discovery as following. Was not a merely idea, but a revelation. At the sight of the skull, I seem to see a, of a sudden lighten up as a vast plane on the flaming sky. The problem, the nature of the criminal, an atavistic being who reproduces in his person the ferocious instincts of primitive humanity and the inferior animals. The discovery of the fossa, which took place, as we have seen at the end of 1870, is described by Lombroso only 35 years later in his opening speech delivered in French of the Sixth International Congress of Criminal Anthropology. With theatrical tone of one of who, now a climb scientist in the world, can afford to talk to a real revelation that uh, had ever allowed to solve the whole problem of the nature of the crime. So Lombroso probably has emphasized that this finding to give more credit to his thesis, or just to defend themselves against accusation once again to work on from prejudice and not by the facts. In this way, whatever the intention of Lombroso, now the myth of Villela's skull had been consecrated forever. It suffice to think that only a few months ago, in an article published by the Wall Street Journal, the leading psychologist and criminology, Adrian Rain, argued that the scientific study of the crime got its start on a cold gray November morning in 1871 on the east coast of Italy. Cesare Lombroso, a psychiatrist and prison doctor at, at Analyzum from, for the criminal insane, was performing a routine autopsy on an infamous Gralabrian brigand named Giuseppe Villella. Lombroso found an, an unusual identification at the base of the Lella skull. From this singular observation, he will go on to become the founding father of modern criminology. Well, in, in spite of the accusation against Lombroso of racism and hatred towards the South, 
The racial animal element is not essential in his world. As evidence of this, the second revelation after that of Villela Skull, which helped Lombroso in developing his theories on the origin of the crime. The most direct proof of atavism was some years later the case of a 22-year-old boy from Bergamo in the northern Italy. Vincenzo Verzeni, who is what the, in the language of modern journalism is called a, a monster, also known in the records of the time as the strangle of the woman or the vampire of Padania. Verzenis can be considered the first Italian case of a sexual serial killer and is still considered as one of the bloodiest serial killers in the history, deriving sexual pleasure from the act of murder by strangulation and from drinking blood and eating the intestines of his victim. Faced with such ferocity, inexplicable through madness or other mental disorders, Lombroso resolved using the controversial nosological concept of moral insanity. This way, Lombroso said, the atavistic theory of crime is completed and corrected, in addition to cerebral malnutrition and to bad nervous conduction. In short, the disease of monstrosity is a death. Hence, not only charges of criminalization of the southern people are unfounded, but also its simplistic reading of Lombroso's theories to excessively reduce his work solely to the attempt to identify criminals through their external aspects of, or atavism. In reality, the criminal men imagined by Lombroso were most was more complex and multifaceted than a primitive man or as, or as a sort of walking museum piece. Indeed, considering the horrible articulation of Lombroso's work, it's understandable that atavism constitutes a milestone in his research, but it was not the ultimate solution to the ambitious question about the origins of crime. In particular, atavism especially influenced only the first edition of Criminal Man, which was modified and amended many times before Lombroso's death. By analyzing the structure of Criminal Man, several theories of the explanation of crime had been gradually refined. According to clinical cases, that range from the initial thesis of the born criminal as a savage to the theory of political criminal and matoid, an ambivalent kind of deviance between genius and insanity, and the occasional criminals defined criminaloids. In addition, Lombrosian research focused not only on criminal faces or their cranial shapes, as is usually thought but also on all physical and psychological characteristics, eventually including their verbal or body language, and even on their artifacts, or rather the whole criminal world. Indeed, the diversity between normal people and criminals will necessarily be reflected in every external manif manifestation of offenders. In short, being criminality in itself a sort of pathology, according to Lombroso, even the criminal language had to be an insane way to communicate. So he began to study all forms of lexicon used by prisoners, from the written to the spoken. For this purpose, he was looked for every form of expression used in Italian prisons, in which we went almost daily. However, Prison conditions were poor at the time, and the rights of the inmates were, was practically non-existent. For example, in order to avoid any risk of communication among criminals, it was not allowed to have some pieces of paper on which to write. So prisoners were forced to use any means available to express their thoughts during the long years of detention. For instance, they left to posterity their own sentence, proclamation, poem, or even just their signature, scrapping away the animal of the jazz used for drinking 
and grabbing the cell wall of the wood of the beds. Lombroso diligently analyzes all these signs and trails, showing in a book the results of this research. The book, this book is entitled Palinsesti dal Carcere. Even though this is considered a minor work, it was on one of the first attempts to study cultural aspects of criminal life in prisons in the history of criminology. In that book, as Lombroso claimed in the foreword, he will to subvert the old belief that the prison, and especially the cell, is a sort of dumb and paralytic organism, or a body without tongue and hands, only because the law had imposed to it to remain silent and motionless. From the analysis of writing of prisoners came out a psychological frame of criminal type, egocentric, detached to others, vain, vengeful, and untruth untruthfully religious. These characteristics led Lombroso to conclude not all that criminals cannot speak the same language of the honest man, but also that criminals speak differently because they feel differently. But the biological signs of criminality were visible and were real stigmata both on the body and produced by the body betrayed by the criminal. So the verbal primitive language of prisoners is accompanied by a more visual language, that of tattoos introduced by sailors returning from South Pacific and in vogue especially among prison population and prostitutes, and that Lombroso saw as another element of their criminal communication. Although tattoos were not exclusive of criminals, um, for Lombroso, tattooing assumes a specific character, a strength, tenacity, and diffusion among the sad class of criminals locked in combat with society. Among whom, the tattoo can be considered, to use a medical legal term, as a professional characteristic. The habit of tattooing their body with imaging representing symbols of strength and explicit allusion to sex among criminals is so common as to become a special trait of them. Our tattooed criminals, that he called living parchments, sometimes surpassed primitive men, tattooing even the genitals. This was the evidence not only of their shamelessness, but also of their uncommon insensibility to pain, not by chance, when Lombroso tried to compare tattoos in criminals and in lunatics, he concluded that while it was almost rare the practice of tattooing among fools, in most, in most cases, tattooed lunatics were normally insane people or rather characterized like criminals by insensibility and paralysis of moral sense. Criminal tattoos were also, according to Lombroso, more violent and obscene in character, often grotesque symbol of viral power, or images showing their criminal career, like organized crime affiliation or description of committed crimes, as we can see in this picture of a rapist with that body totally covered by tattoos, symbolizing committed crime of sexual violence. Other recurring topics were of lubricious and option figures or revenge intention, like in the picture of a criminal included by Lombroso in the first edition of The Criminal Man. A prisoner displaying several tattoos, including snakes, an emblem of a Savoy on the penis, and a cross of daggers surrounded by the motto, Juro di vendicarmi, I swear to avenge myself in the chest. In his more detailed and objective analysis, Lombroso tried to study all kinds of aberrant behavior, from criminality to madness, with a body-centered social scientific approach. His search was not limited to bodies of prisoners and mentally incapacitated, however. He even analyzes several bi biographies of great writers, artists, politicians and poets with the aim to, of understanding the secret of deviance or rather why some people emerged from the quiet pathways of so-called normality either for the merits 
like criminals, or m for merits like men of genius. The explanation of the crime proposed by Lombroso was not in fact crystallized in a theory, but was constituted instead of a composite picture in which the causes of criminal agency, while often having a biological substrate, overlapped and intersected each other. To atavism was added moral insanity and the epilepsy, giving rise to a form of multifaceted explanation of crime. This approach is similar to that used by the FBI in the United States in 1970 when two officers began to focus on the figure of the criminals, ca cataloging all murderers by their characteristic and laying the foundation of modern criminal profiling. Of course, today, many Lombrosian theses have been manifestly denied by contemporary scientists, so that the most common criticism to Lombroso has been its total lack of scientific spirit, to use the words of the British criminologist Charles Goring. Despite the often justified claims, however, it's possible to argue that biological explanation of criminality described by Lombroso, at least at least in the essential questions, is not so far from the latest biological studies of crime developed by neuroscientists and genetists for using cartoon. So, if not jurist and criminology, in Italy today aims to at revitalizing Lombroso's thesis on the born criminal, one may ask, however, whether the legacy of, of Lombroso has been picked up by forensic psychologists and neuroscientists. It's therefore not surprising that these techniques, far from remaining closed in aseptic laboratories, have now entered even the austere courtrooms. This is the field of neurocriminology, or rather using neuroscience to understand and prevent crime that, in the Adrian Reigns' opinion, is revolutionizing our understanding of what drives bad behavior. Neurocriminology is only one of the multifaceted sides of the neuroscientific paradigm, which considers those as a result of synaptic connection or mere brain images to be captured by fMRI, is now permeating all areas of knowledge from art, neuroesthetic, to economy, neuroeconomy, or even religion, neurotheology. So the use of neuroscience in criminal courtrooms is not only a typical phenomenon of the American courts, having infected Italian courts in recent times. As I've analyzed in my book, in two recent Italian judgments, neuroscientific and genetic tools were used in assessing criminal responsibility. The Bayot case, where the accused were, was considered more inclined to aggressive behavior if provoked or socially excluded, or suffering from a sort of genetic vulnerability. And the Albertani case, where a woman charged with multiple accounts of aggravated murder of her sister and the attempted murder of her parents was recognized as a sort of natural bull killer due to some abnormalities in her brain. In both cases, it will be easy to achieve similar results regarding the criminal responsibility through traditional methods used by psychiatry without carrying out any brain scan or submitting the accused to complex genetic tests. So in reality, this judgment assumes a strong symbolic and ideological meaning because they represent the wish to impose also in the juridical field what has been called the neurification of the humanities, social sciences, public policy, and the law. Even the press and the media reporting more and more shocking news on the entrance of neuroscientists in the court have contributed to the creation of a sort of myth around the neurosciences themselves. 
consciously or unconsciously, the media with this picture used to show the public how brain works, in reality are contributing to the complex mechanism of neuromanic imperialism that is grotesquely simplifying and degrading the humanity to a mere neuron movement. This is especially evident in the field of criminal law and criminology, where neuroscience want to have the duty of distinguishing bad from mad. In the trials I have analyzed, the opinion of the expert, not binding on the court, became a sort of legal evidence, binding the judge's decision. As we have seen, the role of expertise in courtroom is today so crucial that it is, it is possible to provocatively claim that the judges are bound to be supplanted by neuroscientists who will write the judgments of conviction or acquittal in their place. Hence, the operation implemented by neuroscience today differ, differs from Lombroso and these coeval alienists only for the, the tools used, more accurate and more technologically advanced. Yesterday as well today, the problem is the same, finding the way to identify elements that can distinguish the monster from normal, creating the polarization, we are good and they are bad, well recognized by Robert Simon in his provocative book entitled Not By Chance, bad men do what good men dream. In short, to have the hegemony in the field of forensic evaluation of insanity. The new power of neuroscience, relying on presumed objectivity, is trying to undermine the old power of forensic psychiatry, which since some decades is in crisis, as is also evidenced by the heated debate triggered on the one hand from the, the new edition of the Bible of Psychiatry, the DSM-5, on May 2013, and on the other hand, the recent polemics against Big Pharma and the widespread medicalization of normality. In other words, we are witnessing, as it's, it is claimed by Nicholas Rose, of a shift from psi disciplines to neuro disciplines, resulting in the slow by inexorable delegitimation of the first in favor of the latter, or rather in the creation of a new way of governing through the brain in the, main, in the name of the brain. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emilia. Now it's your turn. Adelante. Beppe Grillo. L'opinion of Beppe Grillo In una delle diapositive eh, c'era un'immagine tratta dal, dal blog di Bebe Grillo che si è espresso uh, con forza a favore della chiusura del museo. Non, non, non so se... La sua No, no, no. No, no, è, è, un, è un vero nome, sì. Sì, sì, sì. sì non è uno pseudonimo, è un leader politico ormai in Italia, quindi è, non è un tempo faceva soltanto il comico, adesso è anche un personaggio di spicco della nostra politica. Mi spiegate? Lino. Gracias por la charla. Eh, el problema de la, del libre arbitrio 
lo trataba Ron Grosso y cómo lo trataba, si te, y sobre todo en relación con la religión, porque no mencionaba que era de origen judío, no sé si tuvo polémicas con los católicos. Sí, eh, io non ne ho parlato adesso perché altrimenti ci sarebbe voluta un'altra lezione, però il problema del libero arbitrio era uno dei nuclei centrali proprio della riflessione di Lombroso dal punto di vista soprattutto del diritto penale. Eh, Lombroso era fermamente convinto che il libero arbitrio non potesse esistere perché le azioni umane erano solo derivanti da una, uh, una sorta di connessione neuronale o movimento comunque eh, di liquidi nel cervello all'epoca insomma le neuroscienze non erano così evolute però era sicuramente convinto essendo un fervente positivista che non esistesse il libero arbitrio e per questo motivo è stato eh, per tutta la vita e anche dopo la sua morte in mh, costante polemica con la Chiesa Cattolica e anche con le altre dottrine di diritto penale che basavano le proprie tesi sull'esistenza del, del libero arbitrio, sulla possibilità di scegliere tra il bene e il male. Questo è stato proprio uno dei motivi per cui eh, la Chiesa, come avevo detto prima Agostino Gemelli, eh, ha, ha criticato moltissimo la sua opera Oscar ha insegnato una foto di Pentonville credo che una prigione di Pentonville dove i prigionieri stavano manciego si vanno eh, ligati no? eh, qual era la opinione di Lombroso acerca del, di un sistema penitenziario tenia un sistema di prigione favorito come il cellulare eh, ¿Pasado en el silencio absoluto o no ha dicho nada sobre sistemas de prisión? Eh, ci sono dei passi nella sua opera perché ha scritto moltissimo ma, eh, in cui si occupa anche del sistema carcerario e si è espresso talvolta a favore anche di un eh, miglioramento delle condizioni carcerarie ah, anche se paradossalmente eh, nella, su nella sua opera prevedeva anche che eh, ci fosse l'internamento a vita per i delinquenti che considerava delinquenti nati e quindi come tali irrecuperabili, quindi era un po' un approccio dalla doppia faccia, ecco, da un lato chiedeva delle condizioni migliori e dall'altro lato però chiedeva addirittura in certi casi anche la pena di morte. Però per quanto riguarda il carcere, ehm, avendo studiato proprio il linguaggio dei criminali, e tutto ciò che veniva prodotto in carcere io non credo che fosse per un tipo di detenzione che costringeva eh, i, i, i prigionieri proprio al silenzio più assoluto oppure a delle privazioni assurde come quelle anche di non poter tenere un diario o non consultare un libro anche perché lui l'ha proprio dichiarato in questo Uh, piccolo volume sui palinsesti del carcere ha detto non è, il carcere non è un luogo muto senza arti e senza lingua insomma come si pensa diciamo, è come se fosse un, un essere vivente insomma non è un luogo così eh, diciamo come se fosse diciamo, qualcosa di morto e che va dimenticato ecco. lui ha studiato per questo moltissimo la vita e tutto ciò che riguardava criminali e anche i carcerati. Pepe? Grazie del tuo. Veramente ci sono un sacco di cose, ma io vorrei eh, incentrarmi nella mia domanda sul museo, non sì. sulle polemiche attuali del museo Lombroso, ma mi chiedevo se eh, il cosiddetto museo Lombroso, ma in vita di Lombroso, la sua collezione era aperta al pubblico, era aperta sotto condizioni speciali, si poteva andare a guardare il museo come adesso il pubblico in generale o piuttosto era una collezione eh, chi, che si faceva vedere agli specialisti ma lui non, non li apriva al pubblico? Eh, vabbè, inizialmente come ho detto prima era una collezione privata però poi eh, è stata in qualche modo aperta non al pubblico a chiunque però agli, agli studiosi come li chiamavano all'epoca gli uomini di scienza eh, è, è stato proprio aperto in occasione di un congresso 
eh, in cui Lombroso ha, eh, ha prima esposto alcune delle opere a Parigi e poi eh, le ha esposte definitivamente a Torino, quindi era soprattutto per i colleghi e, e tra l'altro anche proprio ai colleghi chiedeva costantemente di inviare materiale proprio per eh, mostrarlo nel suo museo, quindi era un qualcosa che condivideva con, con i propri colleghi. No, lui diciamo, ha scritto un articolo su un, su un giornale poco prima che morisse, si chiamava proprio Il mio museo, dove racconta in termini un po' romanzati la storia del museo e, e eh, più che al pubblico alla fine conclude con una frase in cui si rivolge alla classe politica attuale, insomma su, eh, contemporanea, che, con cui era sempre molto critico e dice forse questo museo dovrebbe essere in qualche modo visitato dai politici e potrebbero capire qualcosa in più sul sistema carcerario e sull'approccio al crimine in generale Quindi questo è proprio quanto affermato da Lombroso stesso sì, seguendo con questa linea eh, però con, passando al, al museo attuale me preguntaba si el, el debate que ha seguido a, a la reapertura del museo en el 2009 ha condicionado eh, posteriormente la, las formas de explicar, las formas de exponer, incluso los objetos exhibidos en, en el museo. Sí, eh, cuando se ha estado a la reapertura, eh, dopo questo lungo periodo di chiusura, eh, i responsabili del riallestimento hanno studiato a lungo per come eh, poter eh, esporre eh, gli oggetti in modo tale che non fossero offensivi e che non si creasse una sorta di museo degli orrori, anche se attualmente molti vanno per curiosità un po' ai limiti del macabro a vedere un po' questi resti umani, però non era eh, questo nelle intenzioni del, del direttore e degli altri eh, studiosi che si sono occupati del riallestimento e per questo motivo alcuni eh, pezzi sono stati sottratti al pubblico come eh, per esempio dei feti eh, oppure dei cervelli in formalina sono stati eliminati, non, si possono, non sono stati esposti pubblicamente e poi si è fatto tutto un percorso nel museo proprio studiato ad arte in modo tale che mettesse sempre in evidenza quali fossero stati gli errori scientifici di Lombroso, quindi anche per come sono stati esposti gli oggetti e la scelta degli stessi è stato fatto in modo tale da evitare che fosse una, una sorta di apologia ma che rientrasse nell'interesse strettamente scientifico tra l'altro bisogna considerare che il museo è nello stesso edificio di ehm, altri due musei eh, che sono un museo di anatomia ehm, e un altro diciamo, è un museo della frutta che, che diciamo, è un museo abbastanza raro di frutta, tutti i tipi di frutta realizzati in cera e, e l'altro appunto che raccoglie busti in ceroplastica e cervelli essiccati secondo una metodologia particolare quindi sono nello stesso edificio proprio come eh, un repertorio di storia della medicina da considerare e da visitare quindi anche congiuntamente sì.
personas que con los rasgos físicos eran considerado, considerados como anormales. Y eso también lleva a ahorita cómo se están tomando las ideas de la voz, porque se está haciendo una clasificación de normalidad y de enfermedades mentales en base a qué, en base a qué comportamientos. Lo están dando completamente a cuestiones genéticas, pero entonces se le da un énfasis a los genes y no a las cuestiones sociales, culturales y biológicas que vive la persona y el individuo para desarrollar cierto comportamiento criminal que no tiene nada que ver con el aspecto físico. Sì, questa è la critica più ricorrente ovviamente che viene fatta alla, alla ricerca lombrosiana, cioè il, il fermarsi a, a delle presunte poi, eh, di, difformità tra un modello che poi non si sa neanche quale fosse diciamo, di normalità e eh, un altro che presenta delle anormalità. Eh, però come avevo, avevo detto prima... Ehm, Nonostante diciamo, Lombroso avesse cercato sempre un substrato biologico, eh, non si è fermato solo alle mh, possibili deformità fisiche, avendo studiato anche tutto il mondo tra, tra virgolette, culturale dei, legato ai delinquenti. Quindi, eh, sì, era anche, bisogna considerare il clima dell'epoca del che segue proprio quello del grande internamento, della eh, segregazione di ogni possibile soggetto che fosse considerato al di fuori dei comodi eh, binari della normalità, quindi era un, cioè, no, non era solo colpa di Lombroso, ecco, sicuramente un po' tutta la psichiatria del tempo andava in questa direzione. Eh, sì, un, eh, in realtà c'è un altro museo in Italia, a Roma, che si chiama Museo Criminologico, che raccoglie eh, dei, dei reperti in parte simili, cioè armi del delitto e altro riguardante la delinquenza in Italia, però eh, sicuramente è molto diverso da quello lombrosiano, perché il Museo di Roma è, eh, riguarda in generale... Eh, un, un periodo storico della criminalità in Italia, mentre quello lombrosiano si può considerare a tutti gli effetti una sorta di apparato iconografico proprio delle, delle sue teorie. Quindi in questo forse sta la peculiarità di, del Museo di Torino. Sì, sicuramente ha lasciato un segno indelebile questa rappresentazione della criminalità così esteriore e forse l'unico punto di svolta, proprio quasi uno spartiacco, è stato proprio negli anni 40 e 900 quando Sutherland ha cominciato a scrivere sulla criminalità dei colletti bianchi, facendo capire che alla fine i criminali non erano solo quelli brutti, sporchi e cattivi, ma c'erano anche la criminalità dell'alta finanza e delle banche, come accade anche sempre più frequentemente. Forse è stato un libro sicuramente profetico, però per molto tempo è sopravvissuta questa idea, a dispetto del fatto se fosse realmente figlia delle idee lombrosiane oppure di una sua generalizzazione eccessiva.
eren els objectes de la casanya, si feia fer un relats. I mica en mica, a mesura que van anar posant els relats criminals, es van anar adaptant a la visió que volia tenir la casanya d'ells. I va acabar conformant biografies que no tenien res a veure amb els criminals, sinó amb la idea que tenia d'ells. I realment ho feien una mica amb l'objectiu d'agradar el criminal. Las cosas que hemos dicho, que les tuvo muchos, muchos cadáveres sobre la disposición, y los alemanes no han hecho ningún, ningún estudio así, de, de, no sé, de o los judíos, o los gitanos, o los rusos, no sé qué en España. No, no, capito, es, exactamente. Está hablando de nazismo, nazismo y... Ah, sí. Bueno, ¿tú, ¿tú tienes algún trabajo sobre el fascismo y...? Sí, sì, il rapporto tra nazismo e teorie lombrosiane, sì, questo che... Sì, però, sì. No, io dico che hubo uh, uh, molti morti nella mm. seconda guerra mondiale, con le scappate mm. di gas, sì. con le forme, pues sì, sì, si approvecciarono a quella gran quantità di materiale per formare un museo, o un istituto per il <ride> Se, se l'ombroso fosse stato in vita chissà cosa avrebbe combinato <ride> meno male che era già morto Pero relazionando lo que, sì. esta, esta pregunta con il tema del fascismo sì, eh, sì io ho, ho analizzato un po' eh, i rapporti tra diritto penale fascista e teorie lombrosiane eh, in uno studio è eh, perché spesso tutto ciò che è deleterio eh, del diritto penale fascista che ancora abbiamo in vigore in Italia nonostante alcuni aggiustamenti e modifiche dopo l'approvazione della Costituzione eh, tutto l'apparato più repressivo introdotto dal legislatore fascista spesso è stato, uh, è stato detto che derivasse dalle teorie lombrosiane quindi ho cercato un po' di vedere qual è stato il vero lascito delle tesi lombrosiane nel diritto penale fascista e effettivamente eh, l'introduzione per esempio delle misure di sicurezza eh, derivava dalla scuola lombrosiana però non nei modi in cui è stato fatto dal legislatore fascista perché il um, Rocco che era il guardasigile dell'epoca eh, a mio avviso ha preso quanto più conveniva al regime anche dalle teorie lombrosiane per avere una, un apparato repressivo che fosse comunque funzionale al regime quindi ha um, preso un po' di teorie da una parte e dall'altra e ha creato una specie di mostrum giuridico questo sistema del doppio binario che in Italia non ha fatto altro che moltiplicare le sanzioni penali, diciamo, raddoppiandole addirittura. Alguna pregunta a me? Vedo, se... No. Molte grazie, Emilia. Grazie a voi.